to be here. Um, you know, Shankar is far too kind. I, I learned all of my biology pretty much from his work and, and from him, uh, going back probably about 20 years. So uh, it's always a pleasure. So I'm going to talk. Uh, yeah. So I'm going to talk about uh, two pieces of work, uh, and this is a, a computer scientist perspective to uh, systems modeling and, and, and how we do analysis uh, of, of systems models. Um, of course, this is work with a, a, an excellent student of mine, Shaheen Mohammadi. Uh, Shankar uh, helped us immensely and greatly with this work, uh, and, and a postdoc of mine who's at IBM now, uh, George. All right. So as I mentioned, by the way, just for, for my sake, how many of you are biologists? How many of you are computer scientists? How many of you are biologists? How many of you are computer scientists? And good. So I, it gives me some sense of, of how to, to, to phrase my, uh, my talk. Anyway, so I'm going to talk about two problems. So um, one is um, if I give you a systems model, think of this as a network, a network of proteins, transcriptions, what have you. And I'll, I'll describe what these things are in some more detail. And I ask you a simple question. Give me a, a sub-network or a set of pathways which tell you how aging happens. Uh, how do you go about doing something like this? Uh, so I'm going to start with that particular problem and give you simple ways of, of doing these things. And somewhere in there, I'll talk uh, about a number of computer science problems for those of you who are into computer science. Uh, and then, of course, all of this, this work is going to be in yeast, uh, which begs the normal and obvious question, how do I then transfer something that's in yeast uh, to a, a more interesting model? Uh, perhaps, how do I model what I've learned here uh, into humans? Now, of course, that itself raises a, a more interesting problem because uh, humans don't necessarily have one kind of tissue. There's any number of different kinds of tissues, which then raises the other problems of, of you know, what is common to tissues, what are different from tissues, what are different across all tissues, uh, and then what part of what tissues are modeled well uh, by the biochemistry of, of yeast. Uh, so these are the kind of problems I'm going to talk about uh, in, in this thing, in this talk. Please stop me and ask me questions at any point. Uh, I would rather do only half of the talking, if that, uh, and have you guys do more of the talking, uh, which would be nice. All right. So I don't know how many of you follow aging. Uh, aging is this fascinating thing. I, I didn't know aging was as sophisticated as, as it actually is. So um, at a very high level, there's two different kinds of agings that happen. One is chronological aging, and one is um, replicative aging. Um, as you might imagine, a replicative lifespan uh, is the number of buds uh, a mother cell can produce uh, before senescence occurs. So if you take a, a, a normal yeast cell, uh, on, on average, it'll have about 29 daughter cells, 29 to 30 daughter cells, uh, and, and that's all it's capable of. Uh, it, it won't have any more daughter cells than that. Uh, as opposed to this, there's something called chronological aging or chronological lifespan, which is the duration of viability after entering the stationary phase. So um, don't quote me on the numbers, but roughly something along the lines of if you start with a new yeast cell, it's going to have 29, 30 daughter cells. It's going to live for about 48 hours after that, and it's going to die. So the chronological aging uh, is what happens at the end of the, you start at the stationary phase, how long is the cell going to live uh, and, and, and then die? So it turns out that um, these two aging regimes are, are really important, uh, and they're controlled by different phenomena. So Let's see how we can, we can infer what these things look like. So at this point, I'm simply setting up the second part of the talk, which is where the meat of, of, of uh, what I'm going to talk about is. So let's start with something like this. This big ball of spaghetti uh, is, is the set of all known interactions uh, of proteins inside of, of yeast. Uh, so I'm going to take all the protein-protein interactions, all of the post-transcriptional modifications, um, phosphorylation events, what have you. I'm going to put it all together. Somehow it's some magic sauce that I'm not talking about right now, uh, but out comes a, 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 a big network like this. Uh, and, and you can start to talk about very interesting problems within, within this network. So this mixed network, in this particular case, contains both biochemical activities, which in a computer science sense you could think of as, as directed edges, uh, and, and protein-protein interactions, which uh, are, are obviously undirected edges in this particular graph. So this thing is, is nasty and large, about 103,000 uh, physical interactions among about 5,700 proteins. Okay, so fairly large, large network here. Uh, there are also about 5,800 biochemical activities, mostly phosphorylation events among about 2,000 kinase substrate pairs. Okay, so this is all data that, that we've put together uh, in, in, in here. 
So uh, if, if you then, there's another set of data which has to do with transcriptional, transcriptional activity or transcript, transcriptional regulations. Uh, and clearly, this is a directed graph. Uh, you can download this from something called yeast track. Contains about 48,000 interactions between 183 transcription factors and about 6,400 uh, target genes. So this is yet another piece of data. Remember, we had protein interactions with one set of data. Um, we had um, the phosphorylation events, which was another set of data, uh, and the transcriptional activity, which was a, a third set of, of, of data here. So somehow, you're going to use all of these things to infer how aging happens. Uh, and, and there are multiple tools that you could use or data sets that you could use to infer something about aging. So we, we know a few things. So uh, it turns out that, oh, I'd say about 60 years back, maybe even more. Um, so in, uh, in an island called Rapa Nui, I think these are Easter Islands. Uh, so some people notice that uh, if you take uh, this product of this particular, pretty sure it's a plant, uh, it was an antifungal agent. Uh, so if you had a, a fungal infection, they would, they would put this on, 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 on skin and, and it would be an antifungal agent. Well, it turned out this thing was actually doing all kinds of other nasty things as well. So it was actually outlawed as an antifungal agent several, several years later. But then if you fast forward to 1990s or thereabouts, um, this thing had some anti-cancer uh, properties as well. So now it's, it's actually coming back. So this thing is called, is called rapamycin. Uh, and, and really what it does is if you take a yeast cell and if you expose it to rapamycin, it causes an arrest in the cell cycle, in, in, in some part of the cell cycle. I think, I, I forget what specific part of the cell cycle, uh, but nevertheless, it, it causes an arrest in, in the cell cycle. So clearly this is, rapamycin is, is something which has some fundamental impact on, on how uh, aging happens inside of cells. So if you take, if you take a yeast cell uh, and you treat it with rapamycin uh, and you look to see the expression profile of the cell, this is roughly what you'll get. So these are the protein names. These are the up regulations and, and down regulations. So this is data from, from a 2010 uh, paper. So very physically, uh, you have some sense of, of what is happening. You also know uh, that, that primarily rapamycin is going towards a, a, a set of proteins, about five proteins, uh, which form something called the Tor complex. Uh, and, and Tor essentially stands for target of rapamycin. So this directly up regulates, down regulates the, the Tor complex. And in doing so, somehow, it is causing significant changes to the age, aging regime of, of the cell. You can do the same thing in different ways as well. So one of the things people know very well is, is if you do calorie restriction, if you take yeast and you grow it in 0.05% in glucose as opposed to 0.5% glucose, you can, by calorie restriction, you can increase both the replicative and the, the chronological lifespan of, of, of the yeast cell. So we know that there are certain controls. We know what their targets are. And now we're trying to figure out all of the machinery down, downstream of this target. So one way to think about how I've set up this problem is there's a, a, there's a membrane, there's rapamycin coming on the membrane, there's a, a membrane receptor, somehow it's going to get down to TOR, uh, and there's a whole bunch of downstream cascade from TOR. And the question I'm asking is, what happens downstream of, of TOR um, that is controlling aging, okay? So this I can set up as something that is a very easy problem for us in computer science. Now, mind you, I've, I've set up this network uh, somewhere else. I haven't given you the details of how to set it up, but ask me and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what it is. You can, in fact, download all of these networks and play with it yourself. So now I'm, I'm, I have located Tor and I'm trying to find out what is essentially downstream of Tor. So Tor, it, it turns out, is actually a major signal transducer. Uh, it, it, it actually impacts a lot of different pathways. But nevertheless, I'm interested in, in what happens in, in aging. I'm going to use something very, very simple. It's called a random walk. Um, a random walk, as the name would suggest, is uh, I've given you a network. I've given you one node in, in, in the network. And you're going to see the random walk from there, which means that you're going to pick a random node and you're going to walk to that random node. You're going to keep doing it, OK? So uh, if you keep doing this, or actually the, the way you set up a model, for those of you who are more statistically minded, this is, uh, this is a, essentially a Markov chain with a transition, transition probability matrix P, uh, where uh, you are a, a node uh, VJ and you're trying to get to node uh, VI uh, and you set this, this Markov chain up cleanly, nothing deep. And what you're looking for, actually let me do, let me do one more thing before I, I tell you what I'm going to do with this. I'm going to define one variant of this random walk process called random walk with restart. Uh, and, and random walk with restart is a slightly different um, random walk process where at each node you're making one of two decisions. You're either going to transition to one of your neighbors or you're going to go back to the start of the random walk, okay? 
So for those of you in computer science, you've seen things like these in PageRank that people do for ranking documents in, 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 uh, on the web. Uh, but nevertheless, fairly simple process. Uh, with, a, with a probability of alpha, you're going to go to the next step, or with a probability 1 minus alpha, you're going to come back to what is called a preference vector. And you can set this up as your initial, initial node where you started, or you can say that, you know, these are the five nodes I will go back to with a certain probability, okay? So the probability 1 minus alpha, you're going to come back here. With the probability alpha, you're going to take the next step. Now, what I want to do is to compute what is called the stationary distribution, okay? So what that means is I'm going to keep doing this random walk. I'm going to do an infinite length, length random walk, and I'm going to ask myself the question, where do I end up, okay? Now, clearly, there's a stationary probability. If you do an infinite random walk, the probability doesn't change if you then increase the random walk length some more. So uh, essentially, if this was the probability, this was the transition, then making one more step of the transition from your initial probabilities will give you the same probability. So this is what you're trying to find, okay? And once again, for those mathematically or computationally oriented, um, this is essentially the eigenvector. Okay, this is the definition of an eigenvector. So if you had a vector of probabilities, if you hit it with the Markov chain, you will get the same vector of probabilities, which means that's the eigenvector of uh, the, the Markov chain. You can also set it, of course, I've now substituted M for my random walk with restart uh, matrix, and I get this particular expression, okay? Uh, you just, there's some slight nuances here. You want to make sure that it's a unit norm, which means that the probabilities are all no, normalized to, to one. Uh, and if you do this, this is the, the dominant vector of, uh, dominant eigenvector. Just by way, since I'm a computer scientist, you can do this either iteratively, uh, or you can do this using just solving a linear system of equations. I'm not going to go into the details, but suffice to say that we know how to do these things. Skip this as well. All right. So let me take a first random walk, simply because this is fun. Uh, not that it has anything directly to do with, with uh, biology itself. Uh, as I mentioned, this is closely related to a, a problem that people solve quite often. It's called PageRank. Uh, and, and the idea here is that if you take the entire web, so Google puts together roughly 0 0.4 to 0 0.4 to 0.5 trillion web documents into one large network. And it somehow tries to rank all the, the nodes in, in this network. Now, as opposed to doing what I was doing before, where I was seeding a random walk at a particular node, Google doesn't do that. You start with an e identical probability of being everywhere. And so these matrices can get tremendously large. And the question is, how do you compute uh, page rank, okay, or node rank, if you will? Um, if you think about it, what I've just defined here really is uh, an iterative pro if you think of that as an iterative process, all I'm trying to do is to compute a to the power n times the initial vector. Okay, that's your eigenvector, where n starts to tend to, to infinity. That was the iterative process that I talked about before. It can also be written as, as a power series representation, and, and this is a power series representation of the page rank process, which is the nth power of, of a. It turns out there's nothing sacred about this. I could have defined any ranking that I wanted. So just, just by way of, of some intuition, if you take um, assuming you guys know what an adjacency matrix of a graph is. So I'm going to take a, a graph, and the adjacency matrix essentially has ones wherever there's an edge. If I take the, the adjacency matrix and multiply it by itself, what I get are two distances. If I multiply it by itself three times, I get three distances and so on, okay? And I'm trying to compute a to the power n, which means that I'm trying to compute a normalized nth, uh, nth distance. There's nothing sacred about that ranking. I could define any ranking I want. I could define any polynomial I want. So I could have said that a ranking is determined by, uh, you know, some constant plus uh, another constant times the first power of a plus another constant times the second power of a and so on. I could define any ranking I want. Turns out that there are actually very neat ways uh, that you can compute these rankings. These are called functional rankings. Uh, turns out people don't actually use functional rankings very much for two reasons. One is they're actually hard to compute, uh, and it also turns out that they're hard to design. Uh, you know, how much weight should I give my second power? How much weight should I give my third power? Or my two neighbors, three neighbors, and so on. These are all very, very sensitive. Turns out you can actually do very neat things with, with functional rankings. Uh, and there's a, for those of you who are interested, there's a neat little, little result that we showed uh, somewhat recently, um, that you can take any polynomial of a graph, and you, you can express it in product forms, which means that it, it now you can express a, a random walk process uh, and not compute polynomials. Matrix polynomials are hard because the second power of A becomes a little dense, third power of A becomes very dense. By the time you get a fourth power of A, the whole matrix is dense. If I give you a matrix of half a, half a trillion by half a trillion, which is dense, no computer in the world can actually store it, okay? So by expressing it as a product, you can now take any polynomial uh, 
and you can express it as a random walk process. And we can show that with very short random walks. This is actually kind of fun. Uh, if I were to ask you this question, everybody is doing a random walk, how do I compute this? You could say, well, start somewhere and do an infinite length random walk. That's one way to do it. Or you could say, everybody starts at different nodes and does very short random walks. So what you do is take a network, you take the next step, drop a token, take the next step, drop a token. You seed one of these processes at every node in your network, and you only do a very short random walk, say 5, 10, and simply count the tokens that you have on different nodes. Turns out the nodes with the largest number of tokens are the highest ranked nodes in the network. So there are these really neat ways of approximating highly ranked nodes uh, in, in, in the network. And we show that all of these work beautifully. We show that um, there are wonderful advantages to doing these things. We show that the results that you get are pretty, they're exactly, almost exactly what you want. I mean, you're not, you're not necessarily interested in ranking all nodes. You're only interested in ranking the first few nodes in the network, and you can do this um, very quickly. I'm not, like I said, these are deep, somewhat deep computer science things and maybe not appropriate for this audience, but all I've tried to, trying to give you a sense uh, was that there are ways where we can compute rankings on large networks uh, extremely quickly. All right. So let me come back to our problem. So now, um, once again, I have a, a, a transmembrane receptor. Rapamycin came in. Rapamycin caused a certain set of, of phosphorylation events. It's act, TOR is actually very close to the, the, the transmembrane receptors. I think it's only about two or three down in the cascade. So now it's gotten to TOR, and I'm trying to figure out what's downstream of TOR. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up a preference vector. Remember I told you uh, that TOR has a... Uh, so there are two factors that I need to compute. One is how many proteins are inside TOR, uh, and how do I set this uh, reset process, which is a restart. How many, how many steps do I go before I do a restart? And I'm going to compute this in such a way that I cover the entire network. Uh, so in this particular case, the alpha parameter, the restart parameter, is set to 0 0.85, which essentially makes sure that the entire network gets covered. And the other thing I'm going to do, oh, I don't have a slide on that. Um, the other thing I'm going to do is to set my preference vector to one of the five proteins that are in the TOR complex. So there are five proteins in the TOR complex. So my the, 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 the random walk restart, uh, the preference vector is set so that it's 0.2 for every one of the five proteins. It's zero for everything else, which means that whenever I restart, I'm going to come back to one of the, the, the TOR complex proteins. Okay? So I've set all of this up, and now I can start to see neat things happening. First of all, in your mind, you should be thinking, why the hell didn't I... I'm sorry, I apologize. Why the heck didn't I do a, a, a shortest path calculation? Oh, it turns out that a shortest path actually only works. A lot of computer scientists think this way. It's, it's actually poor simply because the data is incomplete, uh, which means that if you take away one, one, even one edge, it causes gross disruption in your shortest paths. Okay, So you don't want to do that. Uh, the second thing is something that was also brought about in, in the previous talk, which is that networks always have compensatory paths. There are multiple paths between, between nodes. And the fact that there are multiple paths actually means something. So in this particular case, you will see uh, this, is a, uh, this is a random walk score on this side. Uh, and, and this is the, uh, the den oh, this is the distance, actually. So what you see is that this is not exactly shortest path. Okay? You can have nodes that are close to each other, which might have poorer random walk scores. You might have nodes which are actually far away that might have much better random walk scores simply because of the multiplicity of paths. So it gives you simple advantages of this nature. All right. So you do something like this, and you start to see neat things now. So what this is, is um, I have now done a random walk, as I mentioned before. And I've, I've, I've gone through the entire network. Each node gets a random walk score. And I've somehow cut off that score. I've, I've somehow said, I'm only interested in the high scores of random walks downstream of, of Tor. What, is, what are these high scores? It turns out these are the high scores. And I've only shown you what it is that those, those proteins are doing. Uh, not necessarily the network of proteins and interactions itself, but this is really what their, what their biological... This, these are simply geo annotations, so biological processes, cellular component, molecular function. Turns out the most significant thing downstream of TOR uh, is structural molecular, uh, molecular activity, RNA processing, um, chromatin organization, nuclear transport. These are all um, uh, cytoskeleton organization. You can imagine that these are all very basic processes associated with, with uh, cell cycle. Okay? So it gives us some sense that it is working. Things are, are working uh, well here. But then it still doesn't give you biological insight. So what did I learn from all of these things? So what you can do is now start to look at specific parts of your network 
and, and ask yourself, what are these things doing? It turns out that one of the, the most statistically significant induced subgraphs is actually RNA processing. The whole thing is RNA processing. So these are the transcription factors associated with RNA processing and, and RNA processing itself. So once again, it starts, it, it makes intuitive sense. But then actually it starts, I'm going to skip this slide, but then you can even go one level deeper and ask yourself the question, how are these protein machinery is coming together specifically. So here is TOR C1, and we know that GAP1 has something to do with aging. Uh, and you're asking yourself the signal, what is the link between TOR C1 and GAP1, which is implicated in, in aging? And you can actually find exactly the most statistically significant enriched pathway from TOR C1 to GAP1, which will tell you what is the relationship between TOR C1 and GAP1 with respect to aging. In this particular case, it goes through TAP42, a whole bunch of transcriptional factors, and I'm going to tell you exactly what they are um, going to GAP1. In fact, we find gaps that we don't know should exist, but we don't know what they are. Um, we also find uh, short circuit proteins that, that are statistically significant. We don't know what their functions are. Uh, for example, uh, if, if, if you look at the major actors that people believe in aging, uh, people know that sirtuin is one of them and, and, and tor is one of them. And there's long been believed that there's a bridge between these two. And we find something called FMP48, some mitochondrial protein. And, and you know, we have never been able to find significantly what FMP48 actually does. So we can actually find neat things which are statistically significant, which we strongly believe are implicated somehow in aging. Now, of course, somebody else needs to go and, and figure out if you're actually just, it's all a modeling error, data noise, or if there's something significant here. All right, so now let me get to the guts of, of what I want to talk about. And this is fun stuff. So now I've given you a network that is implicated in something. In this particular case, it happened to be aging, okay? And I want to see how I can project this machinery, this little protein machinery, into, say, uh, a, a machinery of, of, of human or biochemistry of, of, of human cells. Uh, in this particular case, unfortunately, I immediately run into the problem. Um, you know, a biologist would ask me, which human cell are you talking about? Uh, clearly different human cells, and some of them pro pro proliferating, others are not. And clearly, if I'm talking about um, cell cycle, they'll, they'll be entirely different machineries, right? So the first thing I'm going to do is to, to try and get some notion of tissue specificity into these networks. And then I'm going to start talking about comparative analysis of these tissue-specific networks. All right. So what am I trying to do here? I'm trying to project functional pathways from well-studied organisms, such as yeast, back to higher-order organisms, such as, as humans, and see if we can make uh, sense out of these things. I'm going to skip this because you're mostly a biological crowd. So why did I use yeast in the first place? Well, it's, it's, it, it grows rapidly. I can manipulate it easily. Uh, it's, it's got a very mature genetic and molecular toolbox. I can, I can do uh, deletion mutants or expression libraries. Uh, and GFP tagged yeast strains. I could do any number of, of, of different experiments of, of this kind. Uh, and there's a large set of, of data that I have on, on yeast. So conceivably, I want to do all of these uh, experiments on yeast uh, and, and then be able to project these back. Now, many of the under underlying functionalities uh, are sh in yeast are shared with higher uh, eukaryotes. So things like cell cycle, program cell death, protein folding, quality control, signaling pathways, um, aging, calorie restriction mediated pathways, all of these things I expect to be conserved between yeast uh, and, and many of the higher level uh, organisms. Let's see if that actually works out. So here's an example of um, conserved nutrient uh, signaling pathways. Uh, this is yeast, worms, flies, mammals, uh, and, and you will see that uh, pretty much across all of these higher order organisms, um, if you look at dietary restriction, uh, it pretty much goes through TOR on one side uh, and the insulin IGF-1-like uh, signaling pathway on, on the other. And this is very nicely conserved uh, across all of these higher uh, organisms. You will see that the TOR signaling pathway is actually also conserved from yeast uh, to worms, flies, and, 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 and mammals. So clearly there is some expectation here that I should be able to learn a lot by doing my experiments here uh, and bringing them here. Okay. There's actually even more aggressive stuff that people have done. They've actually taken experiments for which the genes are actually not expressed in, in yeast, uh, and, and they've expressed it hetero heterologously uh, in, in yeast, uh, done a whole bunch of experiments in yeast, uh, and then brought them back and, and validated them on, on uh, stem cells in, in humans. Uh, 
so this was a, a nice paper that appeared in Nature in 2013, uh, where they showed that NAB strongly prote protects cells from alpha, alpha synuclein toxicity uh, in a humanized yeast model. And they call it a humanized yeast model uh, because the, the genes that they were experimenting with are actually not natively expressed in, in yeast. Uh, and they went ahead and, and heterolog heterologously expressed it. And, and then we're able to prove that in, a, in an IPS model, uh, NAB does work uh, in, the in the manner that is pr uh, predicted in yeast. So to do this, let's ask the first question, uh, which is for wh which tissues is used to good model organisms? And then the obvious follow-on question is what are the shared missing functional components of yeast uh, as compared to human tissues? So I'm going to set this up as a computer science problem. For that, I have to ask myself what data I'm going to start from. Uh, the first thing I have to do is to somehow tease my tissues apart into, or, or my, uh, my global human cellular data into different tissue specific data. And I'm going to go start with the, the gene atlas data set. Uh, and I'm going to pull 79 different tissues, about 44 or 45,000 human transcripts. Uh, and the expression data set typically come from, from AFI or, or some custom GNF1 uh, array. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start uh, with a complete human network. Uh, and I'm going to build a vertex-induced subgraph of, of this global network. And I'm going to do this based on the GNF gene atlas data set. And I'm going to consider a gene as being present in a tissue if its normalized expression level is, is greater than uh, 200. Uh, essentially, which means that it's significantly over or underexpressed compared to, uh, to the nominal or, or the baseline. There's some interesting problems there as well, and I'm going, not going to talk about it, but, but I'm going to give you a gist of this particular problem. Um, so I've, I've given you a, a, a comprehensive expression profile of, of a large number of genes, and I'm asking you this question, actually it's a, it's a twofold question, which tissues are similar, and in what similar set of tissues are what genes over underexpressed? Uh, and, and what people normally do is they, they look at the entire uh, expression profile, they compute an average expression profile, and then they tell you what is statistically different with respect to this average expression profile. Uh, we say that this is not necessarily a good way of doing this because if you look at the biochemistry of a cell, uh, you will see that if you're assaying, you know, 7,000 proteins, about 4,000 of them are actually going to be expressed in every cell. Uh, we call these housekeeping proteins, and I'll get to that in, in some more detail. So really what happens is if you compute a composite profile of all cells, it is dominated by the housekeeping proteins. And if it's dominated by the housekeeping proteins, if you're trying to do a diff with respect to this, you're really in the noise. So the first thing you ought to be doing is that you compute your, your uh, housekeeping proteins, essentially remove that from your signal, and now you're truly working with the signal. And you use that signal to essentially then classify proteins. And like I said, that's a, a different talk for a different day. Uh, but somehow, for now, assume that you've, you've actually been able to tease these apart into 79 different uh, tissue types. Um, the protein sequences are themselves just by way of completion, downloaded from ensemble. Uh, the two reference genomes for the human and the yeast are, are as follows. The number of protein sequences are about 101,000 for human, about 6,700 for, for yeast. And, and we use a fairly expensive, oops, fairly expensive um, alignment algorithm because you want good alignments for these things. This is something else I'm not going to touch upon very much, but it's actually a very hard problem. So this is, I've given you a network here, which is a very large network, and I've given you another network here. And I'm asking you the question, line these up and tell me what is common to these, these networks. And there are many, many formulations of this problem. What we use in this is something called belief propagation. It's set up as an integer quadratic programming problem. Uh, it's, it's an optimization problem. Uh, where essentially what I'm working on is the product graph of the two input graphs. Uh, and, and essentially I'm going to do belief propagation in these things, which means that line, lining up two nodes gives me a certain belief that I'm going to pro propagate on this product network uh, and I'm going to maximize uh, so that my total belief is, is, is as high as possible, okay? So that's the, the setup of the, the integer quadratic problem. And I'm going to come up with some nifty ways of, of constraining the, the solution space uh, and, and then come up with some other way of, of optimizing this. So this is, this is what I'm going to use, but I'm just going to take a sidebar because many of you might have heard of this thing. Uh, so let me take a sidebar here and talk about the network alignment problem itself. So let's say I've given you a network in red, I've given you a network in, in blue, and I'm asking you the question, think of these as a bunch of proteins, bunch of proteins here, there's a certain protein machinery here, protein machinery here, and I'm asking you the question, how well do these things line up or find me the best alignment of something here with, with something here, okay? Uh, and it turns out that uh, Somebody came up with this idea. Uh, it's called isoRank. It's a fairly simple gen generalization of page rank, which simply says that this guy is similar to this guy if its neighbors are similar to its, 
this guy's neighbors, okay? So much as what would happen in page rank, if you remember, if, if you recall how page rank works, I am I'm an important node if my neighbors are important. This is how page rank works. Here it says that an alignment is important if its neighbor's alignments is important, okay? So you can write this down as, as a simple iterative form, which is that the similarity of, of so now I've given you a network with n nodes and a network with, with m nodes. So I get an n by m matrix of similarities. These are node pair similarities. I can write this matrix X in this particular iterative form where X is some normalized form of the adjacency matrix of the first graph times X times the normalized form of the adjacency matrix of the second graph with a slight catch here that I also have some prior information which is that you know this I know that this protein is similar to this protein but not to others. So I can code that prior in a matrix called H. So I can run blast all to all across all of these proteins and I will get this large blast all to all, all, all matrix. Now of course that tells me node node similarity and I'm going to use the node node similarity and somehow include the topological similarity to come up with such, such a pairing. And, and there's a parameter here mu. I say that I really don't care much for the node node similarities. I care a lot more for the topological similarities. So you can pick mu to be say 0 0.8 which means that give a 0 0.2 weight to the node node similarity 0 0.8 weight to the topological similarities. So people have, have come up with schemes like these and in fact there's a neat little sidebar. This was the sidebar. If you start to do this, if I just gave you, if I just gave you this particular form and, and each of these matrices A and B, these are the graphs and each of them had 10,000 nodes. What do you think would happen to this? Any, any takers? The computer scientists should know these. So once again, you're trying to compute this. I've given you two graphs, A and B, and these are both, say, 10,000 by 10,000 matrices. What do you think will happen in iteration two of this? What ends up happening is that X becomes dense, okay? And the moment X becomes dense, iteration three takes forever. You can't do this anymore. So in fact, the people who do this are actually quite heroic. I don't know how they get their results, because imagine a 10,000 by 10,000 dense matrix. You can barely even store it, let alone do any, any computations. What well, turns out they're actually neat computer science things that you can do here. Uh, you, you can break that similarity matrix into outer product forms. You can do these very, very neat, uh, in, in very neat ways. And we show that you can actually scale these, these computations to very, very large graphs, which is actually kind of neat. And then of course, once you get the similarity matrix, you have to somehow compute a matching. You can do these with other computer science matching things. All right, I'm gonna skip this, I'm gonna skip this. All right, so what do I have here? So now I have four different things here. One is the global human interactome. I have the 79 tissue specific networks that have computed using expression data sets. I have this notion of universal genes, which are ubiquitously expressed subset of human genes corresponding to housekeeping functions. And I have something called a tissue, random tissue specific network. So let me get on my soap, soapbox for a little bit. So a lot of people who do analyses of different kinds will somehow apply an algorithm, come up with a result and tell you, here's a neat little result. I can assure you that there's so much noise and so much data here, I can pretty much give you any result. To me, what is more interesting than the result itself is the significance of the result, okay? So if I line two networks up and I tell you that I found a pathway of 100 proteins that is common to these networks, that is not the end of it. In fact, that's sort of the start of it because I have to then tell you what the p-value of this thing is, what is the surprisingness of these th this thing is. It turns out that is a lot harder to do than simply aligning networks, okay? So to do that, we actually have to come up with this notion of what a random tissue looks like. And that's very hard to do. Uh, because uh, essentially what I'm saying is, this is my random tissue and I'm gonna generate a million of these and I'm gonna line all of them up against reference tissue. And if in one of those million I can find a better alignment, then the p-value of this particular alignment is one in a million, okay? That requires both a very strong design of this, this random tissue and a very large number of these simulations, which all take a lot of time. But nevertheless, I do, we, we do these quite, quite well. Of these, what you would get is the original alignment, which is the alignment of a tissue-specific network with, with yeast. You'll get a Monte, Monte, Monte Carlo simulation, which is that I've now generated a million of these random tissues. I have aligned all of them up with yeast, and some estimate of how many of those alignments are actually better than the one that I observed. Uh, of course, I can then use that to gen positive, generate positive negative cases, compute a, a p-value, and then from that I can compute an alignment p-value, okay? And out of all of this comes this neat little thing which tells me what is the machinery that is conserved, 
across yeast and, and tissues. What is the machinery that is human specific? What is the machinery that is unclassified? Okay. And I'm going to skip some of these definitions in the interest of showing you what the results look like. All right. So this is the first result. And I apologize that you can't see this. I, I, I can't think of how I could show this uh, in any other way on, on, on a slide. But, uh, but suffice to say, uh, this is ribosome, this is proteasome, uh, this is cap dependent uh, initiation uh, processing of, of uh, pre RNA processing of some kind. Okay? So, this is the machinery. So, now remember what I've done. I've taken these 79 tissue specific networks and I have first, the first thing I do is to line all of them against each other. And I'm asking the question, what is common to all of the 79 tissues? And it turns out that this is what comes out is common to, to all 79 tissues. And this is kind of neat. I can, I can then tease apart all of these little machines uh, which correspond to these functions. So, they're uh, there are five of these functions, five of these networks. Uh, so this is common to all of all of the tissues. In fact, this is ri ribosome biogenesis, translation, protein targeting, RNA splicing, mRNA surveillance. All of this makes sense. Okay, these are the statistically most significant uh, aligned parts of these things. Um, you can also ask yourself, what is the functional enrichment of ho ho housekeeping genes? And, and these are the kind of structures, or these are the kind of terms that start to come out: anatomical structure development, paracrine signaling, NADH, dehydrogenase, things like that. Okay. Um, the next question you could ask yourself is, for what cells is yeast a good model organism? And the way I'm answering that question is, I've taken all of these tissue-specific networks and I've lined them up with yeast, and now I'm asking, where do I get strong alignments? And we get some interesting and, and somewhat, some obvious, some non-obvious answers. So if I were to simply say that, uh, you know, of blood and, and, and ganglions, which would line up better with, with yeast, most of you would probably say blood probably is more related to yeast than ganglions. And, and sure enough, you start to see these, the myeloid cells, the monocytes, the dendritic cells, NK cells, T helper cells. All of these things have extremely low p-values, which means that their alignment is very surprising with respect to a random model, which means that their alignment means something. They actually are very similar to, to yeast. So this is, there, there in fact, even some really, um, there, there are some uh, cancer cell lines here as well. Uh, which seem, which are well aligned with yeast, which is good. It tells us that the biochemistry of yeast is a good model organism for, for messing with, with all of these, these cells. And on the, on the flip side, you can also ask yourself uh, what tissues are most unlike yeast. And it turns out that the ganglions are most unlike yeast, which is unsurprising to some extent. Okay? And I'll even tell you why the ganglions are, are unlike yeast at all, what part of the network makes them completely unlike, unlike yeast. All right. So, the first thing I'm going to do is I can take my 79 tissues, just based on my, my, my p-values before, I can now tell you what are the groupings of tissues. So this, there's a big, huge group, and, and every node in that group is similar to each other and also similar to yeast. It turns out these are blood cells. You can look at another whole set of tissues, uh, and, and these are largely dissimilar to yeast. Uh, these are brain tissues, ganglions, testes tissues. There's a certain nifty problem here. These are somewhat similar, somewhat dissimilar, and I'll tell, if you ask me, I'll tell you why, why we, we get these things. But now the 79 tissues nicely group themselves uh, in, in this particular uh, fashion. Now you can start asking the, the next question as well, which is of the conserved machinery and the human specific machinery, what is most statistically uh, significant? So if you look at blood, you get things like um, cell cycle phase transition, DNA repair, DNA packaging, nuclear envelope organization, uh, these are the, the most statistically, uh, DNA replication, things like that. These are the most statistically significant conserved machinery uh, in blood. But perhaps more interesting is what is human specific, which is not modeled in the yeast biochemistry. You get things like um, lymphocyte activation, uh, lymphocyte proliferation, uh, caspase activity. These are all uh, blood specific, or human specific, and, and not conserved in, in, in yeast. Um, just as interesting, um, you can ask yourself the question, uh, what is brain, what are unique brain selective functions? Uh, the ones that are conserved, you will see things like development, um, cholesterol biosynthesis and transport, regulation of nervous system development, things like that. But perhaps more interesting here uh, is, uh, what is what is not conserved in yeast. And you get things like neuron-neuron transmission, uh, glutamate receptor, which is a neurotransmitter. And, and so clearly there's not as significant a cell-cell signaling in yeast. And so all of the cell-cell signaling, organ development, all of these comes out as machinery that is in, in, in brain whose biochemistry is not well modeled in, in yeast at all. So this starts to give you some sense of, of what you should yeast use 
uh, as, as a model, what you should use yeast as a model algorithm for. But then you can then start asking the next question is, as well, which is conserve disease classes uh, in, inside of these things. So in this particular case, I'm, I'm still giving you results only for blood and, and, and brain. Remember, those are the clusters that I, I showed you before. Uh, if you look at conserved genes, disease classes, you know, things like cancers pop out as, as with a p-value of ten, roughly 10 to the power minus 3, uh, chemodependencies, pharma, pharmacogenomic uh, um, diseases, they all have a relatively low uh, p-value. But in human-specific uh, genes, the disease class, um, Im immune-related diseases, infections, uh, immune related, immune system related diseases are very, very statistically significant. 10 to the power minus 9. Um, psychiatric, neurological disorders uh, are also statistically significant here. But if you look one level down, you actually start to see really neat things. So this is the other advantage of doing something like this. So now you're trying to find out maybe perhaps target genes. So you have a bunch of disorders and you're trying to find out uh, where do I start my, my experiments. In this particular case, I've, I've listed a bunch of, of uh, brain-related disorders, schizophrenia, autism, dementia, things like that. And I've listed here the p-values in the conserved genes and p-values in the human-specific genes. And in most of these cases, you will see that the p-value in human-specific genes is much lower than those in the conserved genes. What that means is that you're more likely, a lot more likely to find disease-implicated genes in the human-specific set of genes in my network alignment than you are in the conserved set of genes, okay? Uh, so these provide much better targets for intervention than, than something, like, something like this. All right. So there's a whole lot more results that I can talk about. Uh, let me conclude at this point, and I'll give you a chance to ask me lots more questions. Um, so what we, what we try to do here is essentially look at tissue-specific networks, um, not just as human networks, not just as one single network, uh, but really added one more level of, of refinement as, as tissue-specific networks. Uh, and perhaps this is one of the first computational investigations into such, such networks. Um, we believe that you can actually get a very much more refined understanding of, of tissue-specific processes and their functions. Like I said, we put all these networks out. If, if you're interested, um, send me an email. or Actually, I'll put a link somewhere that you can download all of these networks from and, and start to, to mess with this uh, yourself. Um, these networks show significant enrichment of a number of important diseases, identifying a number of, of potential drug, I should say potential drug targets. Uh, so you're, you're much better off trying to find targets in, in human-specific parts. Uh, and, and once again, one could argue of course, you would have a lot of questions that such comparative analysis sheds light on humanized yeast models, why a humanized yeast model works and why it doesn't work. And that's not to say that you can design a humanized yeast model, but, but rather that what is the machinery that, that lets a certain humanized process uh, work. So that is what I had for you today. Uh, thank you to uh, the center for, for making all of this possible. And thank you for your attention. Questions? Please. Hi, uh, sorry, maybe I misunderstood, but how exactly do you generate representations of random tissue? I feel ah, like good your question, excellent question. P value analysis would be very so, sensitive to Absolutely, kind of absolutely. So, so let me set the question up, because this is a, I, I skipped over it. it. This was probably what caused us the most heartache. Um, so the question is as follows. I've given you two networks, and you have found a common component of 100 nodes here. Okay, and I'm trying to find out: Could this have happened by accident, or does it actually mean anything? So that's the question I'm trying to answer. Okay. So take the zeroth order answer to this question, which is that I'm going to assume some random model, and I'm going to assume the weakest random model. So the weakest random model could be something like an Erdős-Renyi or what is called a GNP network. So what it is is that there are n nodes in this network, and the probability p of there being an edge between any pair can be computed. So let's say I've given you a tissue with, with 10,000 nodes and an average degree of uh, 10. Then I simply have my parameterization of GNP, which is that n is 10,000 and, and uh, the, the uh, degree is 10 over 10,000. I'm sorry, the probability is 10 over 10,000. Okay? So if I simply do this, what will happen is that almost all alignments will have extremely low p-values. They'll be extremely surprising which is that this network is completely oblivious to everything else. So when you line this GNP network, this random graph, with a tissue, you will get absolutely no alignments. And, and what that will do is it will pick everything up as extremely statistically significant. Okay? On the other hand, if, if I pick a random model that is almost exactly the tissue, 
nothing will come out as being surprising. So you will get very high p-values for everything. So the question is, how do you build a model that gives you sufficient descriptive power to, to compute these, these p-values? So the way we went about doing this, and it took us a lot of work to do this, is to say, first, go ahead and line all of the 79 human tissues with each other, okay? And what that gives you is essentially a core. The, the core alignment will give you the set of the, the machinery that is common to all of the, the tissues, okay? We then line that up with yeast, and we get a certain alignment. And what we're saying is, this is not our signal. Simply because the core of the network matches the core of yeast should not give you any surprisingness to the alignment, okay? So the first thing we do in our random model is to simply pick the core, and the core is the core of our random model. And what that does for us is that if there's a thousand node matching component in the middle, which is the core, it's not going to mean anything at all because every one of those will match, okay? Then the next thing we do is to get a distribution of everything around the core and where it attaches to in the core. And now to build a random tissue, we then draw from that distribution and connect to the core, okay? So this gives us a, a, a random, random tissue model. And then of course we do this, you know, I only went to a p-value of 10 to the power minus four, so we only do 10,000 of those. So we'll generate 10,000 of these random tissues that, and, and then line them all up. So that's, that's how we do it. This is kind of sort of a non-parametric bootstrap, but that's it. Can you this? Absolutely non-parametric, yes, and it's a boot, sort of a bootstrap process. Please. So, so these proteins have uh, very specific domains that allow them to interact, the SH2, SH3, yeah. the PHPX, and so on and so forth. So how the weightage of that, each of these, uh, in, how, how do you that. So, 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 the question uh, is, or if I may rephrase the question, please correct me if I've rephrased wrong, which is that certain proteins here will, will have a certain set of binding domains, what have you, which will only match with, with certain other set of, of, of um, binding domains here. How do you account for this information in my alignments? Uh, and, and really, what, the way that gets in is the, uh, is the H matrix matrix. And once again, I apologize because I skipped a little bit. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll show you in this context, but in belief propagation, it works the same way. So this H matrix is coding that information, okay? So this, remember, this matrix is as many proteins as there are in the first organism versus as many proteins are in the second organism. And the ijth element of this will tell you how similar are the, the binding pockets or, or the functional sites uh, in, in those proteins, okay? So, and, and I do this using Smith-Waterman. So I, I generate this matrix using Smith-Waterman, and that'll tell you what, to what extent is what protein similar to what other protein. And, and this is how it gets into that similarity that I'm computing. In belief propagation, it actually is a constraint, which tells me I will only put a one, a protein can only line up with another protein if it has a certain common domain. Uh, so I can generate that as a set of constraints, which then constrains my integer uh, programming problem that I'm solving. Um, yeah, so in, in this figure, I just want to be sure that I understand your similarity. Um, of the four yellow nodes, the two that are, I guess, closest to us are similar because they have common um, neighbors. But the two sort of above them or behind yeah. them, are, are those two are similar, but they're not the same as the ones in front, right? Because they don't have common neighbors. Sure, so, sure. So, so here's, here's a question. Um, so the idea here is, the question is, why are these two similar? So I know that there's some similarity between this and this, okay? And that could have been bootstrapped from my initial node similarity. I know that this protein has a good alignment with this particular protein. So I have some similarity here. I have some similarity of this protein with this protein and this protein with this protein. So what ends up happening is that this pairwise similarity, let me take this example. This pairwise similarity will yield some belief that its neighbors might be similar. Now here, two things are happening. This thing lines up with this thing sequence-wise, but also that its neighbors end up lining up sequence-wise. And so you get a much stronger belief that these two proteins are lined up with each other. Uh, so, so what ends up happening is that you essentially propagate both the node similarities and the topological similarities in this process. And this will tell you that well, for whatever reason, this, these two came out similar, these two came out similar, 
because their neighbors were similar, either because of sequence similarity or because their second neighbors happened to be similar as well. So that would be the second iteration of this process. Remember, this is the x in terms of x, so you have to do this iteratively over and over. So you do this to convergence, and that would be the nth neighbor. So you take, in, you in fact propagate the entire information all the way to the nth neighbor back to you and say that if, if my neighbors are similar, then I'm going to be similar. Oh, if my neighbor's neighbors are similar, then this gets multiplied twice over by mu, so it, it gets attenuated, uh, and it's only 0 0.8 times 0 0.8, so you get less weight to it. So that's how, that's how you would compute the, the similarities. But is, is the actual implication that the four yellow nodes are similar to each other? No. no. The implication is that this yellow is similar to this, and this yellow is similar to this. In, in the sense that, yes, they both have, they both bind to each other, and their neighbors are similar as well. Please. Look, looking at the, the yeast and, say, blood cells versus yeast and neuronal cells. I mean, yeah. there are cell cycle proteins that put, that's what you're probably pulling up, that's right? Exactly what I'm between, sure, yes. between the Absolutely. yeast and the blood yeah, cells. Yeah. And that's what you're not pulling up from neuronal cells. Absolutely. Well, so, 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 yeah, the, so let me show you what exactly comes out of this. So this is, this is what is conserved and housekeeping, okay? Which means that it's housekeeping across all 79 tissues and it's conserved between the human tissues and, and yeast. And so these are the most statistically significant things that I'm pulling out. And indeed, this is ribosome, this is proteasome, um, I apologize. I can't even read these things. So, so the, these are the major components, as you mentioned, which I expect fully conserved, not only across all 79 tissues, but also across yeast. And this is exactly what my alignment is giving me. This is very comforting, exactly. These, these machineries, and they're not exactly, so for those of you in computer science, this is not isomorphism. I'm not giving you exact subgraph isomorphisms here. These are isomorphisms, they're not even isomorphisms, they're matchings in some loose sense, because it lets me incorporate noise, it lets me incorporate priors. So these are not exactly identical, these subgraphs that you're seeing here, these are not exactly occurring in both human and yeast. They're actually some approximate representations optimized for the cost function that I mentioned before. But it is comforting that all of the big things that you find here are things that you expect to see. There are no other questions. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.